I got a question for you today, something for you to think about. We've just read Mark chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and we've read verses 35 through 43. But here's a question. What are you afraid of? I don't want you to answer it out loud. I especially don't want you to answer it to your neighbor and talk, because that would give me a complex. What are you afraid of? I mean, is it pain? I'm afraid of pain. Is it poverty? Is it death? Is it disease? Is it the unknown? Is it that these things may come upon a loved one? Is it loneliness? What are you afraid of? Fear is a crippling emotion. It damages our calm, fills our souls with anxiety, causes us to act irrationally and drives a wedge between us and God. Those of you who are Facebook friends with me know that I like to watch videos that are sent to me, usually stupid ones, and then if I like it, I post it somewhere where you all can see it and be bothered and waste the same amount of time that I did. One that I saw this week was about cats. Of course, there are a lot about cats because cats are goofy creatures. Boy, if there was ever a proof that there's no such thing as natural selection, it's got to be cats. Cats wouldn't live on their own. They're dumb creatures. But this whole thing was about what cats do when they're afraid. And they were funny things. I mean, they stand right up and do just all kind of weird stuff. And I was sitting there just laughing like a stupid person uh, as I'm watching these cats react. But then I got to thinking, you know what? <coughs> Sometimes we're a lot like those cats. When we get afraid, we make silly sounds, right? If you get woken up out of a dead sleep and you think that you're in great danger, um, sometimes you can make embarrassing sounds or do something uh, embarrassing. <coughs> My sister and I were bad people. Uh, we used to uh, get a great kick out of letting mom fall asleep get into a deep sleep where she's snoring, and then wake her up suddenly to see all of the uh, contortions that she would go through when she was startled awake. We were bad people. Good, nobody said amen, but, uh, but I, was, I was, that was bad, but it was funny. Um, but fear makes us do stupid stuff, irrational stuff. So if you think it through, you'd be like, um, you're not solving anything by running around in a circle. You're not solving anything by just screaming random words. This is not fixing anything. Fear paralyzes. Fear torments. Fear is an awful thing. And a lot of times, it can drive a wedge between us and God. And there's no real, when you peel, peel it all away, there's no real logic behind it. What are you afraid of? Well, so-and-so might have a problem. Such and such might happen. I'm worried about the what-ifs. The what-ifs haven't even happened. Well, God's not helping me. God's not helping you with something that doesn't exist. Fear is crippling. 
Our passage today brings us to a, a very intense story. I can tell you, now listen, I love all my kids, I really do, but there is a special something for the baby girl in the house. Just, it, it, it just is. And I think some of you dads know what I'm talking about. Um, and I, I'm being sappy today. I, I hope you don't mind. Just take the ride with me. Um, Sarah was my little girl. She was the, 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 the baby. And when she was 12, everybody else was uh, either on the way out of the house or just had an attitude. Um, and, uh, and Sarah still allowed herself, I think that last year, to be daddy's little girl. And I really appreciated that. Uh, Sarah had learned, she had seen the light. Uh, in 2003, uh, she became a Red Sox fan. And in 2004, my 12-year-old little girl and I got to stay up and watch those three agonizing games where the Red Sox lost to the Yankees, one after the other after the other. And they were down three games to none, and one more game would have ended their hopes to get in once again. Yet my little girl sat with me in the basement and uh, we watched the Red Sox win their first one, then their next one, then their next one. And I woke her up during the last one, during the next one, and they made it to the World Series. <coughs> me and my little 12 year old. She would wear a Red Sox hat. I'm sure she didn't do it on her own, but when she would be with me and we were watching baseball and we'd eat popcorn together, she'd wear my hat, my Red Sox hat. She was daddy's little girl. There's something there. And then, by the way, just in case you don't know how the rest of the story ended, when they went to the World Series for the first time in a long time, game one they won, game two they won, game three they won, game four they won, they broke the curse. And I got to go through that with my little 12-year-old. It was, there's something about daddy's little girl. I want to tell you something. There's a guy named Jarius, and he had an issue. His little girl, his little 12-year-old, was sick and was dying. This was his world. And he runs to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, my little girl is dying. you got to come and heal her. He knew that uh, he was a healer. He knew that some things going on. By the way, if you think it through, um, this was not something easy for Jairus to do. He was the ruler of the synagogue, and in other synagogues, the rulers were kicking people out of the synagogue for believing in Jesus. So... He was taking a risky step, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit, but Jairus was, was, was desperate. He had to talk to Jesus. This was a life and death situation. My little girl is dying. I got to get something to happen here. All of a sudden, a woman shows up, bumps into him, and Jesus stops everything and deals with this woman and heals her and and, and, yeah, okay, I mean, she had an issue of blood, but she had it for 12 years. This can wait for a little bit. My girl, my 12-year-old, my world, she's dying. You imagine the anxiety, the fear, the terror. I don't know how I'm going to go home. And if my, I, I come home and I see my little girl, my world, 
with her eyes closed and her no longer breathing and no, I'm going to have to put her in the ground. I don't know how I could go on. You imagine the fear. One last hope, though. I can get to Jesus. But the crowd surrounded him. Everything was slow. And then he stops to deal with this woman who touched me. And I could just picture, and if it were me, I'd be like, who cares? Move on. We got something to do here. No, he stopped. And he dealt with compassion with this lady. It said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Be whole of thy plague. And while he yet spake, verse 35, there came a ruler from the er, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, why troublest thou the master? His greatest fear. My world. My little girl. My sweet, innocent, twelve year old girl is dead. I tried. Jesus couldn't make it in time. And you can imagine the lump in his throat and the tear in his eyes and the confusion of why did Jesus delay? He could do anything, it seemed, but he didn't seem to be bothered here all kinds of emotion welling up within him and before he could say a word in reacting Jesus gave two commands Jesus said be not afraid only believe see we can be going through some very intense stuff diagnosis on a health issue, fear with loved ones, all kinds of stuff. And I don't know what's going to happen next. And I don't know how I could handle it if it does. And oh God, what am I going to do? Listen, stop. Fear not. Fear's just going to make you do irrational things. They're not going to fix anything. Fear not. Only believe. Man, could you imagine how our lives would change if when we walk through the darkest valleys we've ever walked through, we get a hold of those two commandments, fear not, only believe. I want you to meditate on those two commandments as we look at this passage today. Jesus says, Be not afraid. Be not afraid of the Master's power. It's interesting, in this region, a while ago, they had thrown Jesus out. Uh, at least in, in the area. <laughs> in the, in uh, in the area just across the sea, in the, 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 sea, in the, um, the area of Decapolis, let me, let me just remind you what, what went on. There was a demoniac. He had 2,000 demons in him or so. That might be a bit unsettling if you saw that. What do you think? And Jesus came along and with great authority... He commanded them to be quiet. They begged him to be sent into pigs. He sent them into pigs. The pigs committed suicide. And everybody said, Whoa! This man has great power. Oh, man, I'm scared to death of this guy. He can talk. Man, if he can talk to 2,000 demons and tell them what to do, I, I'm, uh, you know, that's, that's wonderful, but um, you can go now. You have way too much power for me to hang around with. 
Well, thank you so much. You can go now, he says. And so uh, they did that. And the guy that was healed says, let me be with your disciples. And Jesus said, no, I got a better job for you. I want you to go back to your people and demonstrate and, uh, and show them the great deliverance God's done to you. So he did. And it was spread all through Decapolis. Whoa. Look at this life-changing power Jesus has. And it was noised all through the area. And then soon after that, we have two folks showing up from the region, from that general region, saying, I need healing. I need the master's touch. And the woman had her, had, had her uh, issue of blood healed. I need the master's touch to save my little girl. And Jesus said, be not afraid. The first thing he's saying is, you know what? I know you were afraid of me a little bit ago. I know you were afraid of my power. I know you were afraid of, of uh, my intensity. But listen, you need to understand I have great power, but I have great love. Be not afraid. Be not afraid of my power. Be not afraid. of my timing. It's interesting, Jesus didn't say be not afraid the first time when Jairus came and said, Master, my daughter's sick, we gotta go. Could you come heal her? And they started. It's interesting, Jesus didn't say then, okay, listen, be not afraid, only believe. And then the woman show up, no. He told him that after these events were happening so that, so that Jairus got this idea. But you know what? Jesus, yes, he's powerful. Yes, he's in control. But he's in control of the timing too. Hey, don't we sometimes judge God harshly because we don't think he keeps our time. Man, we do. We say, God, what's the hold up? I've been praying about this. Don't you see there's something to be done here? Don't you see there's deliverance to be had here? Hey, come on, let's move on here. And we wouldn't probably talk like that, but we think like that. Or we abandon talking to God and then talk to some uh, some other, try to get some other answer, some secular answer, some uh, other uh, thing, some other end run to, to some uh, a pragmatic solution rather than, than God's way because, oh my goodness, I'm not getting deliverance right away. Listen, God's timing is perfect. Isn't it interesting that this is, the, this is not the only time that God delays? How about this? Remember the story of Lazarus? If you look at uh, John chapter 11, Lazarus is sick. And the Bible says, therefore, he stayed two more days. What are you doing? Jesus said, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to demonstrate my power. What could we say? Be not afraid, only believe. Jesus says, or God says through the Apostle Paul in uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 that we shall uh, reap in due season if we faint not. It's not just if we faint not, but reap when in due season. See, it's God's timing. And God's timing is not our timing. Be not afraid of my timing. Listen, I know what I'm doing. Listen, I knew before the foundation of the world that this woman was going to come and get her issue of blood healed. I know what's going on. I'm in control. Listen, be not afraid. <laughs> he 
here's our problem. You say, but God, I don't know what's going on. And that matters why? If I'm just believing, I don't need to know what's going on. Be not afraid of the master's power. Be not afraid of the master's timing. Be not afraid of the master's tolerance. Sometimes we think, you know what? Maybe I've just bothered him too much. Maybe I've just prayed about this thing too much. Maybe uh, this, this thing that I'm asking for, maybe it's just something that I have coming to me because I've just messed up so many times and so God's just going to hit me in the head with a shovel anyway. So I don't, know, I don't even know why in the world I should even bother him with this. It's interesting. There's some folks from Jarius' house showed up. And I don't think they were believers. I think that Jairus had some, some folks in the house that said, hey, listen, you're the ruler of the synagogue. You should not be messing with this religious crazy guy who is going to mess everything up with our standing with the Pharisees. Leave him alone. <laughs> and so, I almost wonder, now they were waiting as soon as she died. She, they came and found him in the crowd. In verse 35, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Don't bother him. She's dead. Almost like, listen, if you really wanted to, and if he really could, he would have taken action. But he didn't, so don't bother him. You know what? And some of us feel like, oh, I didn't mean to be a bother. Okay. Listen, when Jesus says, be not afraid, don't be afraid to go to Jesus about something that's bothering you because he loves you more than you'll ever know. So don't you get that thing where you say, well, I, I guess I won't bother him. I guess I won't talk to him about that. I mean, I've been such a failure. I've been such a, 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 a disappointment to him. I'm sure he doesn't want to hear about what bad things happening in, in my life right now because I probably brought it on myself anyway. Listen, be not afraid. Only believe. Believe what? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Be not afraid. Only believe. Why? Because faith will remove the barrier to deliverance. Be not afraid. Only believe that, a mas that the master hears the cries of a believer. Look at verse 37. Suffered no man to follow him, but... Uh, Save Peter and James and John and the brother of James. Now look at verse 40. Well, or, or verse 39, pick it up. And he came uh, in, he saith unto them, Why do you make this ado and, and weep? And the damsel, the damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. They laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. If I'm reading this right, it looks like God made a separation. All right, I'm going to take my top disciples, and I'm going to take the folks that were believing, and you guys get to come in. All these other fake folks, these folks that were like, oh, don't bother him. 
these folks that were making the big ado and the, and the weeping, and a lot of times they would weep and, and wail because that's what was expected. Put them out. See, I need you to understand that the Master hears believers. The Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. Listen, fear not, only believe if you cry to him, Abba, Father, because I am a born-again believer. I've been washed in the blood. I've been uh, adopted. I am a son of God. That when I say, Daddy, Daddy hears you. Man, other folks may not hear you because he's not their daddy, but my daddy hears me when I say, oh, daddy, I'm in trouble. And daddy says, I'm right here. Be not afraid. Only believe. Daddy hears you. Only believe that the master is tender, not terrifying. I want you to get this. I want you to look at this story at verse 38. And you come into the house of the ruler of the synagogue and see the tumult. The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. You don't need to weep, because in me, in me, she's alive. There's no reason to fear. But then look, I want you to get it. Verse 41, he took the damsel by the hand. I want you to picture this. This is the master, the loving master, taking this hand of this precious 12-year-old, her, her lifeless hand, holding it in his. Now, this is not judgment. This is not anger. This is not the terror of the Lord. This is a tender, compassionate act for a broken-hearted dad and a frail little girl. Be not afraid. Only believe. Little girl, I'm telling you, get up. Man, you ought to get a hold of that. That tender, compassionate moment. Be not afraid. Only believe that he is tender, not terrifying. But listen to this. Be not afraid. Only believe that he's got the power to command the dead to live. I want you to get that. Be not afraid. Only believe that he can speak life to the dead. Amen. Now, I'll tell you what, if he can speak life to the dead, then he can help you find your keys. <laughs> if he can speak life to the dead, then he can help your wayward child. Right. Yes. If he can speak life to the dead, then he can help you face this valley of dread that you're walking through. If he can speak life to the dead, there is not anything that he can't do for his child, and if you're saved, you're one of his. Hallelujah. He can speak life to the dead. Now get a hold of this. Not only did he say, little girl, sweet little 12-year-old girl, I want you to get up. But guess what? She did. Now, it's interesting. First thing she, he did is say, now get her some food. And you look at that and you say, well, maybe she died of hunger. No, that wasn't it. I want you to understand the culture back then. Back then, and I guess we do it today, we believe any kind of foolishness except for what's in front of our face. You know, what's, what's in front of our face is there was somebody that was dead that woke up and lived. So, remember, what had just happened? A little bit ago, he said to 2,000 demons, get out, and, they, and, and, and there was um, demon-possessed bacon running everywhere. 
Okay. So maybe she's a ghost. Maybe I saw her ghost get up. And you could see how that would happen. And so folks, folks had seen spirits and ghosts. Now, one thing about ghosts, though they look real, guess what? Everybody knows something about ghosts. What's that? Ghosts can't eat. One of the evidences of life that would happen, that, you no, know, this is not a ghost, everybody. Look, eat. Oh, you're not a ghost. You eat. So this was what's happening. I want you to understand. I can speak, Jesus is saying this, listen, be not afraid, only believe that the master can speak life to the dead and the dead really actually, literally live. Man. So what are you facing? Is it the fear of death? Is it the uncertainty of death? Is it, you know what, I'm not sure where I'd go if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died on the cross so that you can know for sure you're going to heaven. He lived a perfect life and died on the cross because all of the works that you could do in the world won't pay for your sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You can't pay for sin on your own, but Jesus paid that price on the cross. So if you ask him to save you, he will. And when you ask him to save you, say, I know I'm a sinner. That seems enough to send me to hell. But Jesus paid that price. You ask him to save you, he gives you life where you were dead. Be not afraid. Only believe. You're a born again believer. You know you're on your way to heaven. What fear are you facing? I bet you're facing something. Most of us do. We don't need to. And again, fear makes us do stupid and irrational things. And it's silly and funny when we watch cats do it. But it's sad when believers do it. Be not afraid. Only believe. 